IndyCar is brought to you on Eurosport by Firestone and Valvoline. Hello, good evening and welcome to the final round of the IndyCar Championship live here on Eurosport. Rob Widow is with you as usual and tonight we should know who the 1995 IndyCar Champion will be. It should be this man, Jacques Villeneuve. Most people agree, I think, that he deserves the championship this year, but there is an outside chance, as you all know, that Al Anser could do it. However, just so you know what's going on, and we're absolutely clear about it, if Jacques Villeneuve finishes in the top seven tonight, he will be the IndyCar champion, despite the outstanding appeal by Penske. Just to let you know, also tonight, if you didn't already know, that John Clement has won the British Touring Car Championship. John Clement in the Vauxhall was second and third in the two races at Ilton Park this afternoon. Alain Menu in the Renault, Alain Menu in the Williams One Run Renault won both the races. So that will have salvaged something at least for the men at Didcot today after a horrible Grand Prix for them. Uh, just to give you some uh, sad news tonight, Keith O'Dor has been hurt at Arvis. We know that he has fractures, we believe he has a broken hip. So everybody here at Eurosport, we all send him our very best wishes. Our best wishes to Keith O'Dor tonight. He won the first race, by the way, today at Arvis, but had a serious accident in the second one. But on with tonight's action, and we're looking we back very, at uh, uh, important appeals going some forward. other races uh, that have been at this great Laguna Seca raceway, car, and this is Andrew Penske Craig, who's setting up, of course, the, on their side. the uh, was new series. To do was to allow this thing to be either rushed uh, or to be done in a, in a slipshod way. What you're going to see here is a proper appeal, conducted properly, uh, and with the right conclusion. It's a shame that uh, what happened at Portland happened and all that kind of stuff, and had it not happened, then we wouldn't be in the predicament we're in right now. It's gone on this long because CART wants to do what's right and, and so on. And so, uh, you know, we definitely need the right answers, especially now that uh, now that it could affect the championships. That's very frustrating that it's gone on this long. You know, uh, we right now we'd like to be sort of celebrating. We'd like to come here to Laguna this weekend and just go out and have a good race, you know, not worry about if we hit uh, someone or something. We just race, race to win. Well, it's annoying. I think it's stupid anyway that there's an appeal that goes on for four months and that uh, it keeps everybody waiting, not only us, but all the guys that are fighting for second position and so on. And uh, it's a little ridiculous. It's not very professional, but you know, that's the way it is. And uh, we'll have to bring it to fight into the game. Well, those all the people, of course, involved in the appeal. Penske are appealing. That will be heard on the 18th of 18th of September, after the end of the season, which some people feel is a little unsatisfactory. And these are the main contenders of the season, of course, and a lot of international drivers. We're looking now at the uh, foreigners, as the Americans call them, and there are more and more of them in the IndyCar series, and it has made for a tremendously exciting year. We began more than six months ago, 16 races ago, if you remember, in the streets of Miami, and my goodness, the time really has flown. At least it has for me. I can't believe that uh, we're about to start the last round of the championship. And the Canadians uh, doing well this season. Jacques Villeneuve, of course, uh, stamping his authority on the championship. And Paul Tracy having, having his usual rather up and down season. He'll be moving to Penske next season. Looking at the Brazilians now, Maurizio Gudelman, very quick in practice here at Monterey on Friday. But uh, Villeneuve has pole position, by the way, if you don't already know, if you don't have CFAX. Uh, Villeneuve has pole position for this evening's race. But quickest in the warm-up this morning, incidentally, was uh, Jimmy Vassar, a man we've been talking about a lot this season. I think a man with huge potential in IndyCars, a man to really watch next year. He was quickest in the warm-up this morning from, guess who, Al Anser Jr. Still looking at the Brazilians, an awful lot of them uh, racing in America now. Christian Fittipaldi has had some uh, good weekends and bad weekends. He's on his way to Newman Haas, Christian Fittipaldi. And Gilles de Ferran, of course, uh, perhaps the most, uh, the Brazilian with the most potential at the moment in IndyCar. He'll stay with Hall next season. That's Raul Bozel, who's not had a good season this year. Andre Ribeiro had a tremendous win. Uh, on the oval a couple of weeks ago with that Honda engine. Everybody talking about the Honda engine. Jim Hall will have one of those next season for uh, Gilles de Ferran. And uh, it could be a great year for Gilles next year. 
Superb driver. He hasn't always had a lot of luck this year. He's had a few offs, a few mechanical breakages, but uh, a tremendous race in Vancouver last weekend. He's got second place for Gilles in the Reynard. And while we're on the subject of Reynard, congratulations to them winning the Constructors' title. They've won that already in 1995. And uh, not only does everybody want a Honda engine next year, most people want a Reynard. But uh, Lola will fight back. We know that. Lola will not take this lying down, nor will Penske. So uh, we can expect another tremendous season in IndyCar next year. As if we haven't had enough excitement already in 1995. Adrian Fernandez, we hear he may be on his way to Barry Green's team. Team Green, the Mexican, getting more success this year, but uh, having his fair share of drama. And he was lucky to get away with that one. He was very lucky to be missed by the rest of the field. Not such a good year for the other Mexican, the Guerrero. Still uh, very much on a learning curve in IndyCar Guerrero. But uh, Fernandez could be on his way, especially if he does go to Team Green. What about the Swedes? Well, Stefan Johansson driving, uh, as usual, last year's Penske. He's had some good races, some bad races. He had a good one last weekend in Vancouver. This is Alicia Salazar, the Chilean, yet another South American. Salazar, a successful sports car driver. And uh, not that much luck in IndyCar. Juan Manuel Fangio II had a couple of races. This will be his third race of the year this season. It's said that he may be on his way to Dan Gurney's Eagle team, and they'll be using the Toyota engine next year. That'll be very interesting. What can one say about Matsushita? Well, to be polite, at least uh, he has finished some races this year, Matsushita, but he uh, is always at the back of the field. Let's look at some of the changes for next year. Well, we know that Jack Villeneuve is going to Didcot, joining Williams Grand Prix Engineering, and that really will be fascinating. He'll start his testing program very soon, I hear, and he'll need every mile of that testing program. He's got to learn some of the circuits. He's got an awful lot to learn about Formula One, but he's a real racer, this guy. Jack Villeneuve, Tracy, going to Penske. And uh, that's how the rookies have done. Christian Fittipaldi, by far the most successful rookie. The rookies being the guys who uh, are in their first season of IndyCar. Gilles de Ferro deserves many more points than that. A great favorite at Reynard, of course. He's done a tremendous amount of development work for them throughout the Formula E, Formula 3, Formula 3000, and now in IndyCar. Uh, living over in America, decided not to go into the back of Formula 1, but to get a competitive drive in IndyCar. A lot of talent, Gilles de Ferran, and uh, really he ought to be up there at the top of the rookie points with Christian Fittipaldi. We're in California, you can always tell that. Uh, looking down on Laguna Seca, it's a very familiar sight. Those of you who've been there will know these uh, burnt grassy hills right next to the Pacific Ocean. Beautiful place, Monterey, on Highway 1. It goes down from San Francisco to Los Angeles. A good driver's circuit this. It's uphill, downhill. It has the famous corkscrew where they come over the brow of the hill and flick right, flick left, and go screaming sharply downhill back towards the uh, start-finish straight. Uh, we'll see some tremendous racing here. There's nothing to lose for a lot of these guys. It's the end of the season. It's contract time. There aren't going to be a lot of changes in the championship. And uh, we should. I think this race will be run very hard and very fast. It often is at Monterey. And let's hope we get a good, clean race without too many yellow flags. And let's hope we don't have a restart as we did last weekend. 84 laps of Laguna Seca. And to remind you what happened this morning, it was Jimmy Vassa, quickest in the warm-up from Al Anso. Then it was Maurizio Gugelman. He's been running very well this weekend. And then it was Carlos Guerrero. Quite a surprise that in the warm-up. Sponsor seeking, contract time, maybe, who knows, Teo Fabi, very quick on Friday, not so quick yesterday, the pace car brings them round now on uh, what should be the last of the uh, parade laps, then we'll be going over live to Laguna Seca with our commentator Paul Page, as usual, and uh, Shakespeare's list, as I call it, to be or not to be. Well, they say he needs to finish eighth, I think it is seventh actually, because he got an extra point for pole position. Those are, those are the ifs and buts, but uh, ifs and buts in motor racing are really are of no use to anybody. We just need to sit back, watch this final round of the series, and see for ourselves what transpires. Gilles de Ferran was seventh quickest in the warm-up this morning, by the way, so it could be a good race for him. And that's a great shot of the circuit. You can see there's 11 corners at Laguna Seca as Jacques Villeneuve leads the field round. 
just taking it nice and easy behind the pace car. And uh, that's Brian Herter right behind him. A tremendous showing from Brian Herter in qualifying yesterday. He and Jimmy Vassar really have uh, been very good to watch this season. 11 corners, I was saying, up and down, and uh, a real driver's circuit. There'll be a huge crowd here. There always is at the end of the season. And watch out uh, for the guys on the Firestone tyres. And watch out for those Honda engines. It could be anybody's race. I think the favourite has to be Jacques Villeneuve. Warming up the tyres, it's a beautiful day in California. There's the grid, Villeneuve and Herter on the front row. And uh, yet another new track record for Villeneuve in that Reynard. Team Green really have got a beautiful setup on that car. And he's taken many, many track records this season. Every time he's uh, had a pole, he's had a track record with it. Then it's Gilles de Farin and Tio Fabi uh, on the next row of the grid. A tremendous performance from both of those. The highly experienced Teo and uh, newcomer Gilles. Then it's Scott Pruitt running on the first turn tyres, Maurizio Gugelman really on form for this, the last race of the year. Gugelman, a bit of a patchy season, lovely guy and a great driver, but not a lot of luck this year. Then Jimmy Vassar, a real coming man in IndyCar with the uh, unpredictable but uh, extremely aggressive Paul Tracy alongside him. That row will be worth watching at the start. Parker Johnston and Andre Ribeiro, uh, Honda Power there, a lot of Honda Power. and. Uh, Maybe too much Honda power for uh, some people next year. Anyway, we will go over now live to Paul Page and Derek Daly to talk us through the beginning of the race at Laguna Seca. We're not quite ready to go over to uh, Paul Page and Derek Daly at Laguna Seca just yet as we watch the uh, grid continuing down towards the back. Frederick Ekblom, that's the first time out for one this uh, season. Mimos Giattarella, who had a flirtation with Formula One. I bet he was watching the Italian Grand Prix today with some interest. Well, weren't we all? What a fantastic race. Uh, another lap now behind the pace car. We expect them uh, coming in for fuel, lap 24 onwards. And so often uh, these races can be decided in pit lane, particularly if you drive for Penske, Newman, Haas or Team Green. They really have had some wonderful pit work, those three teams this year, and the drivers will be very grateful for that. Picking up places in the pits is very gratifying. Look at that, Reynard, a tremendous result for them this season. Championship constructors. And uh, will their man, Jacques Villeneuve, be the champion driver by the end of tonight? I think uh, he probably will, but we just don't know. There you can see some of the good passing places uh, at uh, Laguna Seca. But they'll be trying to pass everywhere tonight. Uh, there's a lot of uh, reputations to be made and to be salvaged at this stage of the season. It's a tremendously long winter break. And this is uh, really the last time to show off to potential teams and sponsors. Mike Andretti, a bit of a patchy season from him, as uh, we've come to expect, actually. But uh, safely uh, at Newman Haas, where he knows the team well, they know him well. You never know quite what to expect from Mike Andretti. He could win it, he could fall off, you just don't know. But uh, you can, he's got a lot of experience here and he'll be right up there. Paul Tracy will be right up there too. A real fighter in a racing car, Paul Tracy. And uh, he's on his way to Penske next season. This is Bobby Rahal's car, the camera on Bobby Rahal's car. A man very disappointed not to be running for the championship with Jacques Villeneuve this season. They had that coming together three or four races ago, a rather controversial coming together, and Bobby Rahal picking up points as usual almost every weekend, very disappointed not to be in with a shot at the uh, championship. So, at the end of this lap, they should be taking the green flag for the start of this uh, 84 lap race. Watch out for the first fuel stops between about lap 24 and about uh, lap 29. Jacques Villeneuve has had six pole positions this year. In fact, he's had six pole positions. That's the corkscrew. Watch out, that's a tremendous corner. Great viewing there. Uh, not only when you're there, but also on television. You've got to get that one absolutely right, or you are off into the countryside. But uh, Villeneuve, six poles in the last nine races, and they've all been track records. And it's the third time on the front row for Brian Herter. This should be a good start. pit state so they're going to try to assemble as best they can before the corner and of course the starter will be watching them so very carefully 
Jackwell now takes him off the corner. The revs come up. And here we go. The final race of the season is underway. Belliot takes him down into the first corner. DeFerrin tucks in very close. Herder works to the outside, as does Fabi. spinning at the back of the field not a factor it gets off safely should be able to get back on that might have been one of the best starts we've Robbie seen gordon. it's robbie gordon to continue his disastrous weekend here started all the way back in 16th and look at the build-up on that rear tire so soft that rubber just sucks up the stones and the gravel offline apparently nudge there reporting by adrian fernandez now to the top of the hill as Velnev begins to pull out a bit of an advantage over second place brian herta in third places we're going yellow they're going to go to a full course yellow and part of their concern has been throughout the weekend when a car gets off in some of those critical areas they'll spray so much rock and sand on the track that it's dangerous for everyone behind so now the front of the field slows down at the end of the first lap and i began to mention that was one of the best starts we have seen on a road course because they were two by two absolutely in tandem in a perfect drag race all the way down so brian herta began to challenge jack villeneuve we can have a look at it in replay as robbie gordon makes his way back on slowly he gets tapped by fernandez that's fernandez off the road everything's okay if you need some tires check those tires out Derek Walker talking with his driver, Robbie Gordon. Another look at this situation that brought out a full course yellow. Tries to go outside Fernandez. Oh, he gets in trouble. And there's the impact. Two cars trying to go on the one small piece of ground and an early time to make an exit, even if you have a badly difficult handling car as Robbie Gordon has had here all weekend. So Robbie Gordon gets it around and gets it back on the track for full court yellow at the conclusion of the first lap. We'll be back. So we're already running under yellow flags. What a disappointment. But there's the order field there from Brian Herter and Gilles de Ferrin in a very useful third position. The yellow flags are out because Robbie Gordon went off on lap one. He tried to overtake uh, not only Fernandez but also Bozell on the outside of that left-hander. I don't think that was ever going to come off. Uh, he was on the dirty stuff. He got it sideways and then Fernandez tapped him and it was all over for Robbie Gordon. But uh, he can, now they're running under yellows, of course, he can make up that time. But uh, that's the kind of thing that Robbie Gordon sometimes does. We're running now with Robbie Gordon. We have a radio contact, by the way, with uh, the uh, Walker team. We'll be able to hear what Robbie Gordon says to Derek Walker and Derek Walker back to Robbie okay, Gordon in the car. And that does make the coverage so much more interesting. You should be okay. I'll let you know. As I say that, I'm talking over the radio communication between them. They're talking about the tyres because uh, Robbie Gordon got a lot of muck and dust and dirt on those tyres after that spin. He kept the engine running now and he's back now at the back of the field. So he's got an awful lot of work to do, but it's been typical really of his season so far. So, green flag. And Villeneuve leads from Brian Herter and Gilles de Ferran. We've just come back to green flag racing at Laguna Seca. A very quick cleanup. Got the debris off the course. Rami Gordon got back in line and his tires and equipment all fine. So now we focus on Brian Herta. The look back to third place, Gilles de Ferran. Tail Fabi is just behind him. And then Mauricio Guzman just ahead. Leading the race is Jack Villeneuve. That's, of course, the position that he needs if he intends to take home the IndyCar Championship. Is the youngest ever to take it and the first from Canada. And every one of these drivers knows how they must protect the four black boots that contact themselves to the road because that has been the topical point here, particularly after the warm-up this morning. And the two leading cars are the two of the best handling cars throughout the morning warm-up this morning. Now moving back to Paul Tracy. Paul Tracy and Scott Pruitt, sixth and seventh. Let's go on board with Paul Tracy. 
Jill DeFerrin got around Brian Herta for second place. Now Fabi moves on Herta. Fabi comes to the inside. Apparently something wrong there with Herta's car. We'll keep an eye on board here. Boy, look at the brakes lock up on DeFerrin just ahead. Brian Herta is in trouble here because three places he's lost in less than two corners. Jan Beekes, you're down there? Yes, Derek. When he came by the front straightaway, you can hear that he had a bad misfire with that forward power plant. So it's either electrical. This early in the race, it wouldn't be a broken header, so it must be electrical problems for Brian Herta. We'll keep an eye on Brian Herta. Too bad that he didn't recognize that during that yellow. He might have been able to pop in and out with a quick change of electronics. Back on board, Paul Tracy, just ahead, sixth place, Scott Pruitt. Uh, just ahead of him is Brian Herta. He is a lame duck. He just went by our commentary booth here, and the engine sounds terrible. In fact, Jan, it does sound like a broken header, very similar to the problem I think Jimmy Vassar had last weekend. There he goes, another pass. He's going to have to make a pit stop. He's got no choice. Gary Terrell, do you have a further update on Brian? Just got a quick word with Chip Ganassi, and yes, uh, it relates to the motor. They don't know if it's electronic specifically, not a header. They are going to bring him in. The crew is over the wall awaiting him now. Oh, such disappointment. This team has had so many of these days where they've just been dogged by tough luck, Paul. Well, he's on the way to you now. Just turned on to the pit road, Gary. There's Brian Herta. come off they'll of course reach for the electronics it's assuming that they don't see anything when they pull the engine calling we can listen for the radio too parker johnstone quick off down in the second turn the hairpin at the end of the long pit straight had terrible the trouble this morning in the morning warm-up went to the line thinking he's going to have a lot of trouble with boost and he's obviously stalled the engine here so this may bring out a yellow flag. I don't know what benefit it will be to, to Brian Herter because that engine problem sounded way, way too difficult to deal with in just a couple of seconds here. But Brian Herter didn't get his nickname High Speed Herter for nothing. It was a winner here in the Indy Lights series. And they're going to get Parker Johnstone underway without having to go to a full course yellow. So that'll keep the track full green condition. IndyCar safety team does a spectacular job. We talk about all the marvelous volunteers as well, both from the uh, marshals, the flag marshals, and folks from the SCCA, the San Francisco region up here, and the IndyCar volunteers, as there's a large group of those as well. Takes literally thousands to put in an IndyCar race on and you really have to thank them for the marvelous job they've done this year and they even work on announcers as i know because of what happened to me yesterday morning so it's thanks to the people down there to put me back in shape believe it or not i ended up on a stretcher yesterday morning and the people down at uh, the medical center and the tony lama human performance center with don andrews Got the nerve trapped out of the way, and I was back in business. Allinger Jr. moving on Jimmy Vassar. Derek Daly apparently spent too much time in an Irish pub in the area. What was, well, never mind. Jan Bikas. We had a chance to check in in Parker Johnstone's pit as he goes by the front straightaway with Doug Peterson. Asked him what happened. He said simply, he just lost it. Spun on his own. Paul? All right, we continue to watch the move of Al Unser Jr. He is the kind of driver that does move forward very quickly, and that's absolutely the formula he needs today. Started 14th, now running 10th, up four positions. What he needs is first place. Michael Andretti working on Rivero. There's little Al lining up behind Ray Hall. During our qualifying show yesterday, we asked Al Jr. what he lacked, and he simply said speed in qualifying. But now we're in a racing mode, which is totally different. And this Penske chassis, as Jan Bikas alluded to earlier, seems to have tire management down a little bit better than some of the other teams. And Al Jr. has enjoyed that type of race consistency. And of course, he's used it to his benefit to win so many races this year. And now. He may be a championship contender, but he's going to need a, need a lot of help, maybe from yellow flags. Allinger Jr., the best finish, of course, his wins at Long Beach, Mid-Ohio, and last week at Vancouver. Tied for the most wins among active drivers with Michael, and if he wins today, he'll tie with Jack for the most wins of the season. That could figure into the way the championship is determined because that's one of the tiebreakers. And the team will tell you that 
They were mentally derailed after that disqualification at Portland, but Alonso Jr. has pulled it all back together to become a contender, whereas this man, really his season fell apart, Paul. Eighth place, Michael Andretti has not been able to convert most laps led and pulls into wins this year. He chases Andre Ribeiro right now. Start at 12th. Bad when you start back at the pack. Listen to the throttle. Has suffered oversteer all weekend here. Back end sliding way too much. miles an hour before he gets on the brake and now it goes even further uphill seven stories high there's a braking zone up here but he's not close enough famous corkscrew roller coaster plunge downhill trying to catch Ribeiro next passing zone is not this corner but the one after it it's down to the hairpin slowest corner can he get down the inside too far behind Second gear, started all over again. So Michael Andretti continues to work on Andre Ribeiro, though he has moved up four positions himself since the start of this race and currently runs in eighth place. The race is still led by Jack Villeneuve. He stays there. He has a championship. He's got to do some work to get these engines straight now. Just seven laps gone at Laguna Seca, and Jacques Villeneuve leads from Gilles de Ferrand, but we're running around the yellow flags yet again. This time, the Italian and the Santa Rosa Petri will be leading the race. Come on, 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 a bit of a Reynard benefit right now with uh, Jacques Villeneuve leading and you can see by how much, well, uh, they're behind the pace car so they're all bunched up but it wasn't a lot more than that before the yellows came out. In third position it's Teo Fabi, a tremendous weekend for Teo. Then uh, Maritza Gujelman in fourth, Scott Pruitt is fifth, Paul Tracy is sixth and Al Anser is tenth. So things not looking good for Al Anser at the moment for the championship. There's Robbie Gordon who went off on the very first lap. Brian Herter, by the way, has been into the pits uh, with uh, the EC and ECU problem on the engine, yet another engine problem for uh, the Chip Ganassi team. They really never had more than their fair share of engine problems. There's Adrian Fernandez, as we said, coming in for a new nose can. I'm not able to tell you why that is. He either ran into the back of somebody or uh, went off the circuit briefly. But uh, they're doing this job uh, quite sensibly and quite obviously under the yellow flag period. Uh, Outside the top six, well, Andre Ribeiro is seventh, Michael Andretti is eighth, Bobby Rahal is ninth, and then uh, rounding out the top ten, as I said, is uh, Ansa Jr. And at the moment, the championship hopes for him don't look good at all, because uh, Villeneuve is leading and he's only got to finish in the top seven tonight. Tire wear is going to be a problem here. We can expect the first stops at about lap 24. Anyway, for more news from the circuit, let's go back to Paul Page and Derek Daly. So we are still under full course yellow. Uh, the Takati team, the Regalis racing, they're working on Adrian Fernandez front nose. He got himself in trouble here. We'll take a look at uh, what caused this situation. It was up in the corkscrew. Whoa, he just missed it. 
And that was a classic case of understeer. You saw his wheels. Watch the front wheels. Turn, turn, plow straight on. When you push like that, that's what you hear the driver's term as push or understeer. He's lucky he didn't collect that tire wall and do a lot more damage. All right, so here is the running order after nine of the 84 laps with uh, the significant change being the Brian Herta removal from second position. And the Farron now had, in fact, before the yellow, been closing right up on the back of Jack Villeneuve. There is the entire order for you. And, of course, you can see by this, too, that Robbie Gordon continues to function all right after that off course early on. Another situation involving Adrian Fernandez. Here we are, green once again. And to make this scenario very interesting, Gilles de Ferran on lap seven set the fastest lap of the race. So right now he has the fastest car out there. He may be a challenger to Villeneuve. Remember what Ganassi said earlier on, or what Brian Herta said. Villeneuve cannot take the type of chances that other, other drivers can. Gary, what do you think? Is Villeneuve in trouble? Well, we just checked with Barry Green, and they're a little bit concerned. Not a major problem, but the car has gone loose. He's got the oversteer situation, and so he's got a bit of a handful. And he said, it's nothing, though, that we think we can, uh, can't can live with. They'll try to make an adjustment on his scheduled pit stop probably sometime after lap 24, between 24 and 29. Up to the top of the corkscrew, Jan Vegas. example that Derek described the understeer that Agent Fernandez had and now we're hearing about oversteer it turns out that almost all of the crews the majority of those are calling in on their radio communication saying the cars are getting loose so watch for that here in the early stages of what we might call phase two here before the first round of pit stops Paul all right watching Jack Villeneuve now to Farron not making that much headway on him yeah, and unfortunately, you couldn't see the pictures, but that was not normal understeer that we saw with Fernandez. That was totally out of control understeer that so was exaggerated when he went off onto the gravel trap. Now DeFerrin is able to close just a bit. As we watch this battle, Derek Daly, the comments by Chip Ganassi criticizing his engine program. Well, that was interesting to me because we have to remember the Newman Haas team with Michael Andretti and Tracy and the Ganassi team enjoy the Ford factory backing. So they should have all the resources they need to have the best of Ford engines. So that may just G Ford up a little bit to make sure those boys don't have those type of troubles in the future. Tightest battle of the race cars. Andretti, Ray Hall, Andrew Jr., 8th, 9th, and 10th. You ride with Ray Hall. Remember that little Al trying to pass Ray Hall at Toronto got in trouble and crashed down in the first turn. Downhill run. 115 miles an hour. That corner is all going to be different next year. This will not be the racetrack. They're going to redesign this facility, spending a lot of money to update this great racetrack here. Laguna Seca, lengthen the pits. Pit boxes will be longer. They can start more cars. Runs through the tire smoke here. Al Unser Jr. is sitting right on the back end. As a matter of fact, the folks here at Laguna Seca are going to make well over a million dollars in improvements to this track. And especially part of the moving of that final turn is going to lengthen the pit lane. And that will allow them to start more cars because that's actually what limits the number of cars you can start here is how long your pit lane is. You don't want to jam them in. Remember, we've had some problems here in the past. Remember a Johansson situation a year ago? Great pictures here, this uphill run. And there's the corkscrew. Woohoo! And television pictures do not even do it justice. It is literally a plunge over the side in a straight sheer drop down. And in the early laps, when you come here for the very first time, it is by far and away the most dramatic series of corners any driver has ever faced. Alan Sir Jr. continues to chase Ray Hall in 10th place, Jan Vegas. Yes, and we've been listening to what Roger Penske has been coaching him along the way. And interestingly enough, they just told him to lean down the engine. They were at 94%. Now they're down to 92%. It'll be interesting to see if that shows on the track. Of course, that will take horsepower away from the machine, but it'll save fuel. So they're saving fuel, obviously.
mostly it has to do with their pit strategy. I wonder if they'll still close in on that battle, Paul. 84 laps of scheduled distance, 14 laps complete. We've had two yellow flags, full course yellows, during that period of time. Alan Sir Jr. continues to work on Ray Hall. And of course, when you lean the fuel down, sometimes the decision is made because he's stuck behind Ray Hall. So if he's not able to go as fast as his car can run, if he is going to be behind Ray Hall, why not turn the fuel mixture down, put less fuel into the engine? You don't need the extra horsepower because you're stuck behind somebody. You can save the fuel for later when you're clear on the racetrack by yourself dump the fuel in make more horsepower and go faster and leaning the engine down now it is not mechanical like it used to be where you could really turn it too far it's all all chip control all electronic and the telemetry in the pit lane can tell the mechanics and the engineers from mercedes-benz if he's done it correctly or not if not they radio back to him or in fact and penske's case they have actually a little message board digital message board on the steering wheels should the radio system not work properly you can see here paul he's clearly faster than ray hall but he can't find a way around ray hall is using a slightly defensive line as he is entitled to do this is a fight for position not anything else we're also seeing a bit of uh, build up off the edge of the line as these soft tires start to shed the rubber and that, of course, makes it a little more precarious for little Al to make one of those daring moves when he will dive inside a corner. Not quite as safe here. You can see all that sand off line. Regularly, you'll see when the cars run right to the edge, it actually sucks some of the dust and sand onto the racetrack. But the car following has to run over it. That is why sometimes you get this mishandling imbalance on these racing cars, which makes this track, as Jimmy Vassar told me this morning, the most difficult track IndyCars race on to get consistency. So the fight continues back here with Bobby Rahal and Al Unser Jr. for ninth, while Jack continues to be the leader of the race, raced by DeFerrin. Fort Live. Just 16 laps gone here at Laguna Seca, and the top six are extremely close. You can see for yourselves how close it is. Jacques Villeneuve is doing a perfect job. He's leading the race, but it's not perfect enough. At least I'm sure he wouldn't think so. He's only just ahead of Gilles de Ferran, and right behind them is Theo Fabi. Then it's Maurizio Gugelman, Scott Bright, and Paul Tracy in sixth position. Still in tenth place is Al Anser in a train of cars. Anser is a lot quicker than the cars ahead of him, but he just cannot get by. Right in front of him is Bobby Rahal, and Rahal, more than anybody else, knows how to defend a position. We're looking at the top three, though. Villeneuve, De Ferran, and Fabi. And boy, how much Gilles De Ferran would love to win this race at the end of the season. He feels he deserves more uh, success than he's had this year. Second in Vancouver last weekend. Uh, in the spare car, that was, too. And now he really is giving Jacques Villeneuve a hard time. A lot of people watching this uh, at home tonight will want Villeneuve to win, particularly the Williams people. They'll want to have uh, the IndyCar champion uh, secure at the end of this race in first place and coming over for uh, his test program. They won both the touring car races at Alton Park today, by the way, just to cheer themselves up a little bit. And they would love it if Villeneuve won tonight. But we're going back live to the circuit with Paul Page and Derek Daly. No. Thought he drove the wheels off this thing. Mind you, I suppose he'd say that anyway, no matter how good or bad he was. But interestingly enough, he starts his test program, and extensive it is with the Penske team in two weeks' time. Tells me before the end of October and November, he will have more test time than he has had all of this season. So Tracy will be a busy boy towards the end of this season. If you try and identify some of the problems at Penske Racing this year, is the fact that Paul Tracy was not there to test part of it? It's hard to tell. I mean, Tracy is known and recognized as a very good test driver. He is also an extremely fast talent, which tends to push your teammates. You know, racing has a habit of going in cycles. One team will not dominate on a regular basis. And we know, and you know, Paul, from, from past history, Roger Penske's teams go in that cycle also, and they will be back, and Tracy hopes they'll be back with him at the top, because he would like to win the IndyCar Championship. 
Here comes Bobby Ray Hall with Al Hunter Jr. still stuck right to the back end of his car, and then Jimmy Vassar runs in 11. Al Unser Jr. in a fuel conserve mode now, apparently, as he stays lined up behind Ray Hall because he doesn't have enough of an edge to go ahead and force his way past. So there's no sense in trying lap after lap and wasting the fuel. You'll get some fresh tires here very shortly. And there's that defensive line, Paul, we saw under braking by Ray Hall. You just move the car offline, maybe one car width, and that means the driver that's maybe thinking of making an attempt down the inside suddenly says no there is not enough room to do it. I saw a great quote by Ray Hall after Friday. He says, I'm happy to be the fastest ball driver here. But then he realized, ah, uh -uh, no, Fabi has that honor. Well, I was talking to him about that, and, and he said, here's Alan Zer Jr. as he tries to move to the inside. Now he just lets him know he's there. A little warning for the top of the hill, don't you think? Oh, you tempt me, and I'll put my nose down. Is what Al Jr. says. He is so good in the braking zones. The Penske car is very stable under braking. Perhaps he sees a weak spot now with Ray Hall, and he may pounce. We're on lap 20. Pit stops will be coming up shortly. Yeah, but you just see that line that Ray Hall used kind of moved over about a full lane on his approach into the top of the corkscrew. Here's another decisive point. And no, Al Unser Jr. doesn't have an opportunity to do it. Four-time winner here, four years in a row, starting in 1984, Bobby Ray Hall. The, I asked him about that quote, you know, the fastest ball guy here, and he said, well, I didn't really say that. I said I was the fastest Lola, the fastest Mercedes, and... Uh, Somebody on the crew said, and the fastest ball guy, oh, no, no, Tails faster than you are. Well, he's the second fastest ball guy at the moment because Seo Fabi is running third and Ray Hall is ninth. And by the way, least we be politically incorrect, at least one of us in the booth has that description and another one is well on the way. <laughs> yeah, lightweight. Christian Fittipaldi hit the pitch. He was 17th at the start, moved up to 12th, and then made a premature pit stop just a few laps ago. You know, I don't believe Al Jr. thinks he has the room, but he thinks he's about to force the issue here. But you can see Ray Hall. He didn't win those four races in a row for no good reason. He understands every line around here. That piece of debris, you saw that? Still, Still on the racetrack. It's offline, though, therefore we don't need to go pick it up. But look at Junior. He's fast off the corners. That gives him the run to the braking zones to maybe attempt a run down the inside. And they are closing on Michael Andretti. They're running a bit faster than Michael and closing in on him. Of course, a battle always slows you down a little bit. Use those offline approaches to try and protect position. Tight line by Junior, under power, under power. It lines him up for the braking zone. Can't make it, but he's quick off the exit. Oh, he's loose, he's loose. You said that this is an area of the course and it's very difficult to balance the car in. Yes, indeed, and this is also the area where a lot of the cars drag sand and dirt onto the racing line. But this is what Junior likes. The run up the hill and have a little look down the inside, but he's too far behind. Vassar still hanging on behind him in 11th place. Climbing to the top of the hill now, up the top of the corkscrew. Al Unser Jr. looks to the inside, but is way too far back to make a move there. So Al Unser Jr. continues to work at Bobby Rahal. He can make the move just about any time. 21 laps of the 84 lap scheduled distance are complete, and Jack Villeneuve, the pole setter, has led from the start. Twenty-one laps gone at Laguna Seca, and this is one of the stories of the race. Bobby Rahal is holding up Al Anser Jr. Al Jr. must be very, very frustrated by this. He's quicker than Rahal. He's quicker than Michael Andretti ahead of Rahal, but he cannot find a way by. Now, Bobby Rahal has won a lot of races at Laguna Seca. He knows every single inch of this track, and just watch Rahal defend his position here. Keep your eyes on Rahal rather than answer. Every time Al Junior looks as though he's going to pull a move on Rahal, Rahal has, has the answer about a split just a thousandth of a second before Al answer. Now, where was Christian Filippaldi? He's way down the field. He's been into the pits and unscheduled to stop that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what they did in that pit stop. They may have uh, altered the front wing angle because uh, a lot of guys out here have been complaining in these early laps about oversteer. They, could. they talk about the car being loose, they mean oversteer by that, and when they say push, they mean understeer, for those of you who, and that's uh, brake locking, that's smoke. 
But uh, uh, Christian Filippelli having a rather low-key race today, but not as low-key as his uncle Emerson, who is even further down the field. But uh, Villeneuve still leads. 22 laps gone now, Villeneuve leads, but only just from Gilles de Ferran and Theo Fabi tucked in behind them in third position as uh, Al Junior brings uh, Penske into the pits. And this uh, is the beginning of the fuel window. It's pretty early for fuel. We thought it'd be lap 24 onwards, but uh, off, come, off come the wheels, on go the new tires, in goes the fuel, and look at this Penske pit work. They're usually absolutely slick with this, and they need to be if uh, Al Junior's gonna pick up some places in these early stops. There was no way he could get by Bobby Rahal. He decided to come into the pits instead, a good decision by the Penske team and uh, he's in and out in uh, a very, very quick time indeed. So it'll be interesting to see what that has done to answer Junior's race, but we go back live now to Paul Page. Not just stop, that breaks off the battle with Bobby Rahal. He is therefore the first of the regulars to come in just as the fuel window opens on lap 24. Jack Villeneuve is still the leader, being chased by DeFerrin, then Teo Fabi, Mauricio Guzman, and Scott Pruitt. Interesting strategy here by Roger Penske. Yes, and that was a good example of a typical Penske move. Realizes losing too much time behind Rahal, couldn't make the pass, get him into the pit lane, then get him out and run by himself. Look at DeFerrin under braking, gets it sideways, locking up those rears. And Mauricio Guzman, I think, having a stellar day, considering he had a huge crash when he had a component failure yesterday, missed the last qualifying session. This car here was his spare car. They rebuilt it around all the good bits left from the crash car. He is having a good day running for. That must have been tough on him, sitting through that final qualifying session, knowing he had no car available, and wondering how bad he was going to suffer in qualifying position. Fortunately, he didn't drop all that much. The time that he set on Friday was a sufficient time, and he started in the third row. Has yet to win in an IndyCar race, but I'll tell you what, his team Pack West, with Mauricio Big Mo, they call him at the wheel, has had a fine season in terms of DNFs. They've really been tracking very cleanly. You may be curious to know what Hollywood is. It's got nothing to do with Hollywood. In fact, it's a brand of cigarettes that is very popular in South America. There's really turn one. It's an extension of the pit straight. To a slower car, it's barely there. To an Indy car, it's pretty tough. Then down to a hairpin. Here's Michael Andretti. As he makes his first stop of the day, he comes in from eighth position. He was able to move up four spots on the start, but then got stuck behind Bobby Rahal and Al Hunter Jr. and has not been able to move up since then. Let's go to Gary. Big change on the handling characteristics. Two full turns that appeared on both sides of the front wing. And Michael, of course, now long gone. He's hoping that he can improve on the handling characteristics. He was loose like so many others. So everybody fighting exactly the situation that you suggested at starting was going to be the problem here. Yes, indeed. And loose condition, e e even without the tire unusual characteristics that we have this weekend this Laguna Seca race track has a history of making Indy cars go loose but we saw that mechanic wind the screw out on that front wing that is taking downforce off these cars off the front wings first second third on the pit straight climbing the hill oh what a great view this is there's that first turn this is turn two in the uh, pit access road. What a great qualifying battle this was, Paul. Remember yesterday's qualifying? Spectacular. Back and forth to Farron, Herta, Fabi, finally Villeneuve. And most of that in the last 60 seconds. And now you see Villeneuve has track position. Look how quick Fabi is up behind. Jill DeFerrin, DeFerrin was slow through there. Fabi, this is outside our commentary box. That's where they drift up close to the sand. And here's the uphill run, the first of the uphill runs. 100 miles an hour of the apex there. Villeneuve has breathing room in these medium speed corners. This is 5-6 in the uphill run to the carousel. Bobby Rahal hit the pits for his first stop of the day, Gary. Routine all the way and nicely done. 12.6 seconds for a fresh set of good years and a full complement of fuel. So Rahal in and out. 
stop number one. Al Unter Jr. has been there. Jimmy Vassar has been into the pits, as has Michael Andretti. And the times are dropping off. Villeneuve is now seven seconds off his qualifying time. And the people behind him are obviously suffering just as much. They are also running slow. Well, they're now reporting that Jack Villeneuve should be in the pits any time now. We'll hang here and see exactly what he plans on doing. Originally, they were talking about making it all the way to lap 30, but the report now is, let's come in next time, which would be at the end of lap 28. And you can see DeFerrin is loose. When he exits these corners, he's got a handful of steering, trying they to steer this car to keep it straight. It. But Jack I can only presume that Faffy has a similar, ha similar handling characteristic, and Villeneuve, who's not. The moment, leading the race, leading the championship, and if stays where he is he will be the champion Al Anser Jr. came into the pits early because he was stuck behind Bobby Rahal and Michael Andretti a good decision by Penske it'll be some laps yet before we know how much uh, that early pit stop will benefit Al Jr. but look how close this top three is and they're going to have to come into the pits at any moment for tires and fuel Villeneuve's lap times are dropping, he's now seven seconds off his qualifying pace and uh, Laguna Seca on a hot day like this is going to be hard on tyres and into the pits he comes as we speak, Jacques Villeneuve is in, Team Green are ready and uh, we've seen some tremendous pit work from him, it didn't look as though either De Ferran or Fabi came in, so now Gilles De Ferran leads the race while Jacques Villeneuve has tyres and fuel in the pits, a slight adjustment to the front wing Quite a long stop this one, out in 14 seconds, and uh, that should be okay for Villeneuve. He's got to finish in the top seven. Obviously, he wants to win the race, but I would have thought that was about the right time for the uh, tyre and fuel stop. Team Green obviously thought so, and they certainly know what they're doing. With his lap times coming down like that, he needed to make a stop, but interestingly, Deferrin and Fabi continued. Now, Al Junior inside the top ten, and there is Gilles de Ferran leading the Grand Prix, as they call it, the Grand Prix of Monterey at Laguna Seca here this evening. Right behind him, Teo Fabi. Then it's Maurizio Gudelman. Maurizio having a tremendous race here today. Then it's Scott Pruitt. And then it's Paul Tracy. And Paul Tracy, the leading Newman Haas Lola today. Michael Andretti uh, strangely off form in California for the last race of the season. Tracy upholding or at least trying to uphold Newman Haas honors in sixth position as Gilles de Ferran brings in the Reynard Mercedes and so does Teo Fabi bring in the Reynard Ford. Now this is an absolutely critical stop for both these guys who will be out of the pits first. De Ferran in Jim Hall's Reynard Mercedes or Teo Fabi in the uh, Reynard Ford. It looks as though de Ferran's out first. Yes he is, my goodness me. He picked up quite a bit on Teo Fabi in that pit stop. Enough to matter anyway. And here comes Villeneuve, as uh, Deferrin and Fabi come out of the pits, Villeneuve is bearing down on them. We'll have a break and be right back at Laguna Seca. Eurosport Live. Well, what a weekend for motor racing. After an absolutely stunning Italian Grand Prix this afternoon, we now have a magnificent IndyCar race here, the last of the year at Laguna Seca. And we're watching Gilles de Ferran and Jacques Villeneuve, two of the major talents of uh, this year's IndyCar series. Gilles de Ferran in Jim Hall's Mercedes-powered Reynard, ahead of Jacques Villeneuve in Team Green's Ford-powered Reynard. They've got past the back marker who was holding them up, and it really is even Stevens now between uh, De Ferran and Villeneuve. Teo Fabi was right with them, but he had a slightly slower pit stop than uh, Gilles De Ferran. Villeneuve came in one lap earlier, and Al Anser came in three laps earlier. So if anything could happen now, we have, uh, we're have we just about uh, five laps short of half distance. And uh, there's a lot of rubber building up offline, a lot of marbles building up offline. They're going to have to be very, very careful here. They're going to have to be inch perfect. And De Ferran will be watching Villeneuve at the same time as trying to get some space between him and the Canadian. Take a short load of fuel. When I was calling the pit stop, you mentioned that he tried to pull away a little too early. I checked with the engineers here and they said they planned on taking a shorter load of fuel. That's why they were able to do it in just over 10 seconds. 
gave him the lead and uh, created a problem trying to catch for Jack. There was another potential problem. Look at this. This was on the lap out of the pits. DeFerrin closing on Carlos Guerrero. Now watch this. Down to the hairpin. Watch Guerrero. Doesn't see him. Squeezes down the inside. Realizes the leaders are there and thankfully gives them room. We were talking about Villeneuve and, and in terms of what he does and how he approaches now, pit stops, everything. Despite the fact that he said it's a routine race for him at the start of the show, that's at least what he told me. The, the question is, doesn't he really have to be careful? Oh, he has to be so careful. What Gilles DeFerrin's team did here with that short fuel load has given him a huge advantage because he has track position. He can go away from the traffic. Villeneuve, we saw him very close to DeFerrin for a couple of laps. There is no way he was going to take a chance and try and charge down the inside of DeFerrin and get his nose chopped off. He has to think championship. This has been a long haul for Team Green. They have done such a superb job at bringing Jack Villeneuve along and they hope to be champions at the end of this day. So no contest at the front of the field here at the moment. They'll now be very, very careful. This is Fangio, of course, driving for Pac West, and he is the replacement for Danny Sullivan this year. And next year, though, we're going to see some very interesting changes in his, uh, in his driving career because he will be a full-time IndyCar driver, we understand, with the new Dan Gurney Toyota-powered effort just ride here a moment because with Fangio's car you can just kind of peek over that protection on his helmet and take a look at the uh, at the dash and some of the indicators. Had a great day here at Mid-Ohio. In fact has tested the load with the Judd engine in preparation for the Toyota Assault next year. Anticipating a stop by Jacques Villeneuve. There he is, Gary. On schedule, Paul. Don't know what the problem is. I'm watching with the crew changing all the tires. I don't know if he suspected he cut a tire or what. This is not fast either. They've got a problem trying to get the rears mounted. A championship could be in the balance. You just don't know. Now he's rolling. That was a 20-second stop. Boy, and a lot of checking of suspension parts. You see him down there wiggling all the control arms to be or not to be. Jack Villeneuve needs to finish eighth or better to clinch the championship. And with that stop, he fell back into 11th place. And Al Unser Jr. needs to finish third or worse if he's then eliminated from the championship. Right now, he is sixth, so he moves up while young Jack falls back. Tony Sakali, Jack's engineer, said earlier, anything can happen. He said, Villeneuve, who's running 11th right now, makes very, very few mistakes in racing situations, but they fear a mechanical problem are getting sucked into somebody else's accident. And they have had a mechanical problem. We do not know yet if it's cured, because all they did was change tires. Wonder what the report on the radio was. Can you imagine the kind of uh, reaction that it sent through the pits when he suddenly reported he was coming in? There's Al Unser Jr., runs sixth. He's chasing Scott Pruitt. That's just ahead of him. And remember, he has to get further forward if he wants to remain alive in this championship. I mentioned Tony Sicali earlier when he began to talk about Al Unser Jr., when he thought could he win, Sakali said if Alonso Jr. qualifies for a race, he's a potential race winner. He is that good in race conditions. And when he smells a possible victory, Alonso Jr. is so good at making moves in traffic, particularly in braking zones. But Laguna Seca doesn't lend itself to long braking zones, particularly if the tires, if you have to be careful with them. Alonso Jr. needs second place. First. He's already pulled his first move. He was one of the first to make the pit stops. Now he's going to see will the rest of the race begin to fall in line for him. And I'll tell you what, this is developing right here into a battle with great potential. Fourth place, Guzelman, fifth place, Pruitt, and then Al Hunter Jr. all lined up together. Gary Terrell? Conflicting reports. Well, now, wait a minute. Barry Green is motioning me back up here. Barry, what was the problem? Next.
actually a front tire, a puncher in a front tire. He thought it was something in the rear, so found the problem with back in there. Okay, that clarifies the situation because all the concern was at the rear. Jacques on the radio thought something had broken in the rear. They checked it. They couldn't find any problem. Now they've examined the tires. There was a puncture up front. That's why the car wasn't handling. You got a glimpse of Barry Green a little bit earlier. He, of course, is the owner of Team Green, Australian from Perth. One of the great guys in IndyCar racing. A lot of fun to be around. Good sense of humor, like most Australians. One of the great team managers in IndyCar racing. Has a special discipline about his team. He says he wants his driver at the truck one hour before the start of every official session. He wants all his mechanics in the morning at the same time to start work. And he wants his driver in the car 15 minutes before the start of every session. He said it is a discipline that he believes everybody should adhere to. And who can complain about his success ratio? Look at Christian Fittipaldi gets loose. Well, Jack Villeneuve on the pit out lap fell from 11th down to 13th place. Lined up behind 12th Christian Fittipaldi right now. Bottom of the hill will probably tell this pass. DeFerrin still the leader. Fabi is second, followed by Tracy Guzelman and Pruitt. As now, Jack Villeneuve must work his way up through the field if he wants to clinch that championship. Thirty-five laps gone at Laguna Seca, and Gilles de Ferran is the leader of the race. Behind him, it's Teo Fabi, then Paul Tracy, Maurizio Gugelman, Scott Pruitt, and Al Ansa Jr. Ooh, 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 Gilles de Ferran going inside the back market. Looked a bit dodgy to begin with, but Gilles de Ferran really has uh, a commanding lead of this, uh, this race at the moment. Al Ansa Jr. is in sixth position, and Jacques Villeneuve is down in eleventh. He came... And when Ari Leyendijk was invited down by awesome Al Arciero to go view that race shop, he said he walked in and he said, whoa, this is a very professional racing team. That was when his interest level went way up to try and get back to IndyCar racing with that particular team. Well, Ivan Stewart probably can prove that that's one whale of a great race shop. So it's Jill DeFerrin that still leads. Paul Tracy is in second place. And then this wonderful lineup of cars. Fabi Guzman, Unser Jr., Pruitt, Michael Andretti. This is a great fight here. If you look closely at Teo Fabi's car, look at the side pod. The front of the side pod has a new aerodynamic device that has been pioneered by Formula One. See that black billboard on the front? In fact, that was developed by Gentech, which is the aerodynamic company that Benetton used in England. Um, this Foresight Racing Team have a contract to aerodynamically develop their own Rainer chassis. And that side fence produces more downforce than that carries under attack. Guzman makes the move now on Teo Fabi and picks up third place. So Fabi is certainly suffering aerodynamically somewhat from that cone there. Oh, undoubtedly, that disturbs the airflow under the car. But we know that's where most of the downforce is made. Underneath these cars, sucks them down. Now Al Jr. goes down the inside. And Al Jr. has Teo Fabi. So Al Unser Jr. moving up toward the front now. Now to follow up on what Jan Vika said earlier, now does the team decide that they're losing too much time and too much track position by staying out there, or will that rubber nose cone wear itself away and fall off Teo Fabi's car? So Al Unser Jr. has moved up to fourth place. Two to go if he wants to remain in the championship, but at the same time, Belnav now runs in 11th place, so he's steadily coming forward. He needs eighth or better. We have mentioned track position so often. When Villeneuve was the leader, it looks nice and easy, looks fast. Now that he's moved back to 11th place, he has to make his way past Christian Fittipaldi. We saw that earlier. He's past Robbie Gordon, but it takes a long time to size up the opposition and make the move only when you're confident. And when you have a championship to think about, you better be very confident before you make the move. Here's Jill DeFerrin. He's first place. He's had the fastest lap of the day at 108.1. And we look back now for second place. It's 11 seconds back. And there he is, Paul Tracy in second. Now we look for Mauricio Guzman to come over the top of the hill. 
There's third place for you. And fourth place, Al Unser Jr. comes down the hill, followed by Scott Pruitt. So that's the top of the order as the fight continues here. And don't forget, you want to see all the race highlights from the week that you would really care about? RPM tonight. You're watching IndyCar live on Eurosport. We are just short of half distance here at Laguna Seca. Rob Widow's with you, and it could not be more exciting. Gilles de Ferran leads from Paul Tracy, Maurizio Gudelman, and Al Anser is in fourth position. Things are not looking very good for Jacques Villeneuve right now. He's down in 12th place. Jacques Villeneuve in 12th position. He had to come into the pits for a front puncture and Bobby Rahal is not at all happy with the Mexican Carlos Guerrero and Bobby Rahal is not the first man to be unhappy with the Mexican this afternoon. He's been holding quite a few people up. He got badly in the way of Teo Fabi. As a result, Fabi went off the circuit and collected a traffic cone on, his, uh, on the right-hand part of his front wing. Well, Bobby Rahal steers into the left-hander and shakes his fist, his right fist at the same time. He's now right up uh, behind uh, Teo Fabi and uh, there may be much much more drama to come yet this is going to be a very unpredictable race we had so many ifs and buts at the beginning and as we said you really have to forget all about ifs and buts yeses and noes and maybes in motor racing it looked as though Jacques Villeneuve had this race under control but that is very far from the case right now. Bobby Rahal, by the way, is moving up through the field as he so often does in these IndyCar races. He's such a smooth, consistent, experienced driver, Rahal, with uh, Mercedes power. He uh, abandoned Honda, we lost the picture. We apologize for the loss of picture, and uh, we'll have it back just as soon as possible. We have it back as Gilles de Ferro leads on to yet another lap. This has been a superb race for the Brazilian. He's done so much work for Reynard. He's been so patient. He wanted to go to Formula One from Formula 3000. There just was not the right drive for him. He's gone to IndyCar, and he's done a very, very good job. And we'll go back live now to Laguna Seca. Yeah, but we get you away from that quiet and back on course. This was just a few moments ago. Ray Hall commenting on the driving of Carlos Guerrero. Watch this. Now that's that's not a findable wave, right? No, and it wasn't the first wave either. Villeneuve is in again. Jacques Villeneuve, lap 45, is back in. He was in 15 laps ago. He moved up to 10th and gives it away with this stop. Tires once again. I, I didn't see any changes on the car, did you? Would have been at the rear wing if there was. Oh, look at the frustration. Roger Penske calculating. Now, remember what Barry Green said. They found a puncture in the right from the last time. So that poses another question as to what caused him to stop after so few laps this time. He's got a brand new tire on that left front. What a struggle this has become trying to win this championship for Jacques Villeneuve. Gary, Gerald, do you have any idea what's going on at Team Green? Well, yeah, I saw a front tire that they were pushing on clearly way down in pressure. Tony Sicali in disgust, in contempt, actually, pointing to the side of the tire. And I thought I saw a little cut or an abrasion there. And so this team that's hammering for a championship, they don't want this thing to have to wait out an appeal. They want it done today. And they're getting roadblock after roadblock. Let's go to Jan. Well, Gary, on the other end of the championship battle, Alan Jr. seems to have things going his way. The car was a little bit loose and they now have told him to go full stiff on the front sway bar. That will make the car tighten it up somewhat. Also remember, he was one of the first to come in. So Allinger Jr. is not that far away from making his second pit stop, Paul. Allinger Jr., fourth place, 17 laps, 20, excuse me, 22 laps since his last stop. 13, not a lucky number for Jack Villeneuve. Both times he has come out of the pits with unscheduled stops, he's fallen into 13th place behind Christian Fittipaldi and he's done that once again. With Gary mentioning that one of Villeneuve's tires has a mark or a nick on the side, that suggests that somewhere along the line Villeneuve has been hit by a front wing end place. That very easy cuts down these tires and I don't know who he was trying to pass but that may be what happened here to Villeneuve. But it's a long uphill battle still, Paul, for Al Jr. He has a long, long way to go yet. 
because Guzman and particularly Paul Tracy will not make his day easy if he has to get into the top two or three positions. Yeah, he's really only moved himself up to the hard part. Marco Greco moves offline, lets Al Unser Jr. and Scott Pruitt through. Don't count out Scott. Once Jr. got past him, Scott's remained right in there. The story today, the continuing battle of tire conservation. You've got to move forward, but at the same time, you got to save your tires. Teo Fabi finally comes in, gets his uh, unapproved aerodynamic device removed, and a change of tires. So Teo Fabi stopping for his second stop, 17 laps after his last. They finally, I guess, decided it was pushing him back way too far. And that's the tire that came off of Villeneuve's car. And there is a chunk of rubber gone from that tire. But look, they're examining that tire to see, was it punctured or is there something on his own car that might actually be nicking those front tires? Perhaps his front wheels rub on the wing of his own car for some reason. Well, at least we're not aware of any contact that might have moved a wing around. You can see there on DeFerrin's car, though, how closely some of those components sit. And the tires themselves operating in their dynamic mode will flex back and forth. If it's moving too much and just barely touches apart, Jack could have a serious problem. Shield DeFerrin's last lap was a 78. Nine seconds off the pace of the pole man, Jack Villeneuve, because he is caught in traffic. And there is our second place man. Watching for third now. Matsushita, John Stone, and there is Guzelman, the third place car. That is a long straight. Then you go all the way back to a battle now. Remember, Al Jr. needs to watch what goes on behind him also. Because to Scott Pruitt, this is a battle for position, remember. Not just Pruitt letting Ulster Jr. have his own way here. What a battle these two ways to the Michigan 500 when Pruitt did pull one over Al Jr. at the critical time on that last lap to win his first ever race. So Al Unser Jr.'s team now talking about stopping in six laps on the 54th. We're just completing the 48th. DeFerrin is still the leader. Tracy, you saw the interval, 10 seconds back from DeFerrin. And then eight seconds back from Tracy is Mauricio Guzelman. And then this battle is five seconds further back from Guzelman. Final race of the 1995 PPG IndyCar World Series. Championship still undecided. Could be decided here today, depending on the positioning of Jock Villeneuve, who got around Christian Fittipaldi and moved into 12th place, but needs to be eighth or better. Al Unser Jr. needs second or first. And if the points sort out in a wrong fashion, wrong from my point of view, then this heads off to an appeals court on September 18th, and the decision could come sometime after that. The appeal, of course, for the disqualification of Al Unser Jr. at Portland. Paul, here's an interesting scenario. Pruitt's all over Al Jr. If he sticks his nose down, the, nose down the inside, I'd have to let him go. So 49 laps are now complete. Al Unser Jr. continuing to watch. Scott Pruitt, who runs just behind him. Jill DeFerrin still leads. Thirty-three laps to go here at Laguna Seca and the news is slightly better for Jacques Villeneuve and this is the reason. Al Ansa Jr. cannot get away from Scott Pruitt and of course if he can't get away from Scott Pruitt he is not going to pass Guldramin or Tracy to get into third or second position and no wonder he... No, it's Philippe Aldi. I was going to say I would have thought Ansa may be coming into the pits as he's having such a battle to stay ahead of Scott Pruitt. In fact it's Emerson Fittipaldi. He's uh, way down in about 15th place. But uh, watching on television, we think something may have come loose under the front wing of Villeneuve's car. In the odd close-up pictures we've had of that car, it looks as though something may be uh, loose under the, underneath the left part of the front wing, which could be chafing that left front tyre. It's only something that we think we've seen here on the screen. Maybe you've seen it too, maybe you think you've seen it. But uh, there could be something on that car that is chafing the front left anyway. It's bad news for Villeneuve down in 12th position at the moment. But of course, Unser needs to be first or second. We go back live now, though, for the latest news from the circuit. 
Paul Page and Derek Daly. Junior and Scott Crew must also have bad handling cars because he doesn't catch them that fast. Alistair Jr. up to the top of the hill, starts down through the corkscrew, Jan Bikas. Yes, and Alistair Jr. is another one of those cars that is starting to get loose because in two laps he'll be in here in the pits and they're going to take at least one turn out of the front wing to try and balance that car out. That may be why Pruitt has been able to close on him, Paul. They're also preparing for DeFerrin. You saw that they had his sign board out in the pits, ready for him to make a stop, the leader of the race. And El Enter Jr. apparently going to stop on the next lap. So we watch for DeFerrin to hit the pits. Paul Tracy should be in right behind him, based on the last set of stops. Watch and Michael. Look how slick. I mean, he, he continues to fight it. He's just having a devil of a time handling that car. Well, you can see a driver earning his, earning his money here. That was Al Jr., you know, I think, that locked up that brake on the way down to that turn two, so he is under pressure. Prude will make a move. Jill DeFerrin makes his turn onto the pit road. He has pits pretty quickly there, and here's Gary Gerald. The nose of the car comes in here. The team, the rookie driver that was fastest here during testing back in the month of June. What a weekend he's enjoyed. Said we will not make any changes on the car. Now Paul Tracy is expected momentarily. He just flies by us into his pit, and they're expecting no changes. Both Tracy and DeFerrin went for the short fill. Here's a 17-second stop, almost 18 for DeFerrin as he's away. DeFerrin takes a very long stop. Mauricio Guzman climbs the hill, and Guzman goes into the lead, but he's not yet stopped. So Guzman picks up the lead from DeFerrin on the stop, and Paul Tracy rolls now. Let's go to Jan. Alexander Jr. has brought it into the Penske pit, and somehow they happen to have the pit, the only one here with shade. So at the moment, Alexander Jr. getting a nice shade here from the bridge. You know, we were looking for that wing change, and I didn't see it. I didn't see him make the change at the front. A nice stop, just over 15 seconds for Alexander Jr. So Al comes back into the fight. And here comes Tail Fabi to try and overhaul Al Unser Jr., who rejoins the fight at eight, but looks like he's going to go a position down. And that's Gordon Fernandez all over again, and they make it because Al Jr. doesn't need. He locks it up the right front, needs to keep this car on the road. Brand we new talk, tires. We oh. talked earlier about DeFerrin's 17-second leisurely stop. He was 14 seconds in the lead over Paul Tracy. So this temporary lead for Mauricio Guzman, I don't think he will threaten DeFerrin's lead when Guzman stops. I was going to be interested to see if Guzman stayed out because he crossed the line behind DeFerrin as DeFerrin was coming out of the pits on the last stop. So this is the first lap that he'll be scored in the lead and the first race that he has led since the Michigan 500. Let's go to Gary. Here's some interesting speculation. We mentioned that Tracy and DeFerrin took the short fill on the first stop. Scott Pruitt had problems on the first stop. He's currently running third. He's stretching it. He's going to go two more laps, then he's coming in, and he's going to get a light load. It's going to be about 32 to 33 gallons. They think they can make up a lot of ground since the others had to take the long fill on their last stop. Will Pruitt become a contender? We're going to find out in about two laps. Currently running in third, DeFerrin in second, Pruitt third, and I'm wondering now about Jack Villeneuve. He is now eighth. That's the position he needs. He stopped ten laps ago. Al Unser Jr. is in tenth. He has a long way to make up, and most of the cars in front of him, save two, save Pruitt and Guzman, have already made their second stop of the day. So it looks like it's tilting once again a little bit toward Jack Villeneuve. And you can see that DeFerrin is brave down that inside move, but you can also see there is lots of tire buildup offline now as this race goes on here. So anybody that wants to move high or forces himself to go high can get in trouble very easy, particularly on the downhill run out of the carousel, out of, out of the uh, corkscrew. Look at Gordon's broken right front wing. Yeah, I think parts of it is laying over on the outside of turn 11. 
that'll change the handling though you know we have seen races though time after time where drivers there's there's the other half of the wing uh time after time where the wing is turned down the wing is missing and the lap times don't change appreciably mm, i don't think that'll be the case for robbie gordon for some reason Derek walker does oh, see that right front no downforce on the right side of the front of the car that's why the wheel is lightly loaded that's why it locks up under braking but Derek walker is at pains to understand why on natural road courses they just simply have not been fast this year they're fast everywhere else but he realizes that Engineering wise, they may. A wanker, man. That was an interesting comment by our boy Robbie. I don't know, I don't know who he was talking about. And Mauricio Guzman comes out of the lead, makes his stop. Jan? Well, it has to go oh, for a moment there. It didn't come up off the air jacks. That's going to hurt the timing here for pit, pit, pit stop. They got the wheels undone, but it took a while to come up. They're waiting for the fuel now. There was no changes made on the aerodynamics. Mauricio Guzman underway. Well, they tried for the short fill, but it wasn't a short stop. 15.3 seconds for Scott Pruitt. I don't know if they had a problem, but they were hoping for something better than that. They're happy, but I think it could have been better. So Pruitt and Guzman make their second, and theoretically the final stop of the race. Michael Andretti coming down the hill, still in pursuit of Al Unser Jr. and just ahead of Teo Fabi. So the second round of stops complete. You saw during those stops Marco Greco with a shredded tire, and they've decided to make a physical change to the car. Apparently they do believe that part of the front wing and nose assembly is getting into that left front. So Jack Villeneuve into the pits again. He was 10th when he came in. So again, he is dropping out of the position he needs to wrap up the championship here. And Alan Sir Jr. cannot now get the bonus point for leading the most laps. And all Jacques has to do is ninth or better if he wants to clinch the championship. 57 laps complete. We're now in the closing moments of the season. Twenty-six laps to go at Laguna Seca and Jacques Villeneuve has yet again been into the pits and I think we were right. We did see something loose underneath that front wing on the left-hand side of the car and uh, certainly Villeneuve has been in for a new front wing so I think what we saw was correct. Something was chafing the left front tyre so now Villeneuve may really be able to go for it and he's absolutely got to although uh, there's no need for any panic because Al Unser is down in tenth position and uh, he needs to be second, don't forget. So the championship looks as though it is going to go Villeneuve's way finally, but uh, what a lot of anxiety and tension for Team Green this afternoon in California. Gilles de Ferran leads the race. This is marvelous news, not only for fans of Gilles de Ferran, but all fans of IndyCar, because uh, Gilles done a tremendous job this year in his rookie year in the Mercedes-powered Reynard for Jim Hall. He leads, uh, he's led most of the race this afternoon. He's driven absolutely beautifully. And uh, with uh, just uh, over 25 laps to go, well, we will see the result of the pit stop soon because uh, everybody's been in for fuel and tires and as the race settles down now, we'll see who's got the uh, fuel and tire stops absolutely correct. Paul Trace is second, Maurizio Gugelman is third, Scott Boot is fourth, Michael Andretti is fifth. That's the top five as we go back now live to the Laguna Seca circuit and Paul Page and Derek Daly. Jack Villeneuve to wrap up the championship. He's 13th. Allenser Jr. is now in a must-win situation. He is in seventh place. And maybe now, finally, Gary Gerald, they have repaired the problem on Villeneuve's car. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of intrigue that surrounds the change. They pulled the old nose off. They immediately covered with a blanket. Billy Camphausen, one of the tech leaders for IndyCar, came over. We got a look at it. We saw some very ragged honeycomb down on the left front side plank of the wing. And then one of the crew members threw it under the blanket and literally ran with the wing back toward the transporter. So they've got it out of here. And the new wing, they're hoping, will not have any problems cutting down a tire. I'm still not, I don't know if they're convinced that was the problem, but they sure got it out of here in a hurry. Well, and as Derek has said so many times today, he can't take the chance. It's that simple. Jack Villeneuve, 13th. You can see Teo Fabi got around Al Unser Jr. Jan Vikas? Earlier we saw Marco Greco come in with that shredded tire, but up here in Robbie Gordon's pit, you can see that the nose is smashed, the wing is missing. That was the contact
conflict that happened between Robbie Gordon and Marco Greco. Simply a case of Gordon working through, Greco not seeing him turning in, and big time contact, as you can see. And so they have now changed it out for a, a, a fresh wing. I assume everything's in good shape on the new nose. Bill Neff, 13. All 26 cars that started this race are still running. We're 60 laps into the run, 24 laps to go in the season. Including Brian Hurt, so maybe Chip Ganassi now knows what that gremlin was, and it will be fixed for next, for next year. Bill Neff, 13th place, meets ninth or better. Ahead of him, John Stone, Rivero, and Fernandez. Take a look at his onboard camera. As he comes swimming, was hoping to get to you a little, little faster than that so you can see him dive down the carousel, but maybe we can stay an entire lap. Originally, Danny Sullivan had hoped to get back into this Bank of America car for this last race at Laguna, but that was a bit ambitious with the broken pelvis. camera to see everything that Fangio learned because it is a learning curve during his first, I suppose it is his rookie IndyCar season, although he doesn't run many races. Balancing the car through the corners with the throttle is the whole key to the overall lap here. One fast corner is no good. As we watch Fangio, Gary Gerald, an update on Villeneuve. Well, Barry Green talking to his driver and the veteran Green trying to keep his driver right in step. He says, we're P13 now. Parker Johnstone is next. P9 is all we need. Just stay focused. They just keep talking him around it. They don't want him to get frustrated over this turn of events with the cut tires. Ninth place is what he needs now. Allinger Jr. needs to win. The bonus point beginning to make a difference here. DeFerrin still the leader. And look at those chunks of rubber beginning to get kicked up on the side of the racetrack. As you go down through from the carousel, down through turn nine in particular, the next corner, the left-hander they're going to go to now, you can clearly see the marbles on the outside of the racing line. There they are right there, a huge buildup of rubber. And inside. And inside also. Venture out there. We continue to watch little Al. He closes once again on tail Fabian. When he came in for that pit stop, he was very happy with the handling of the car. He has slipped back in position, not because there's any problem with the car, but just by virtue of the timing of that pit stop. So he has the potential of getting back to those positions he had earlier, but at the moment, a lot of traffic to work through, Paul. Right behind there is Bobby Rahal. Winner at Laguna Seca started from the front row, but one, and that was Ray Hall in '87 when he started third. DeFerrin started third today. Fastest lap of the race by Jill DeFerrin came on lap seven, chasing Jack Villeneuve 108.1 miles an hour. The EDS scoring system flashing all these facts to us. Really, we're talking multiple systems that EDS supplies. We watch and have everything controlled off of a, uh, a system provided specifically for television. The media has another system, and then there's an absolute fail-safe system that works for the officials of the race. So should we lose what we have, they still readily score the race all electronically, all by computer. It's really marvelous. Vassar, whose car does not like the sunshine. As soon as the sun comes out, this car becomes a bit of a handful. This is a fight for position, though, behind Bobby Rahal. Interesting, when it was cool, Jimmy Vassar had the fastest car here on the morning warm of this morning and yesterday morning, Saturday. 62 laps complete, 84 the scheduled distance. It's still DeFerrin, leading Paul Tracy and Jack Villeneuve and Alan Jr. battle. We now have 20 laps to go here at Laguna Seca in the last IndyCar race of the season as you watch Andre Ribeiro climbing out of the uh, Honda powered car. He lost it uh, as, Shield, as the leader Gilles Deferrin went past him. He went off on the outside of the circuit across the uh, sand and uh, 
There is uh, no way he's going to take any further part in this race, quite obviously. He's had some good races this year, Andre Ribeiro, but he is out here at Laguna Seca. There are no yellow flags as yet. The car is in a safe position. The running order is the Gilles de Ferran still leads from Paul Tracy, Maurizio Gugelman, Scott Pruitt, Michael Andretti and Teo Fabi in sixth position. Al Unser is in seventh and Jacques Villeneuve is thirteenth. Whoa, that looked as though that was going to happen for a few seconds and then it did and this may well bring out a yellow flag. No, that's the Ribeiro accident, my, for my apologies, that was a replay of the Ribeiro accident. Uh, and we know now we now know that that car is in a safe position so no yellows anyway Gilles de Ferran leads with less than 20 laps ago to go and uh, well a motor racing accident but uh, Ribeiro lucky to get away with that it was uh, either Herter or Vassar I think that was Vassar uh, running wide into uh, Ribeiro and sending uh, Ribeiro sliding at high speed across the sand and into the uh, concrete barrier. One of the Chip Ganassi cars, either Herter or Vassar, I think it was Jimmy Vassar, uh, running very wide and Ribeiro trying to stay on his outside through that corner and uh, it was never going to come off for either of them. So, Gilles de Ferran really driving a superb race uh, this afternoon in California. The pace car is out. So, uh, with 65 laps gone, the pace car is out. They obviously feel that uh, Ribeiro's car is in a dangerous position. You can see the top six for yourselves. And I remind you that Jacques Villeneuve is in 13th position. What a shame that Team Green did not have a TV monitor so they could have seen those close-up pictures that we saw of something breaking loose on the left part of the front wing of that Reynard. I'm sure that's what caused the tyre to chafe. But anyway, uh, Villeneuve still has a chance. Now, Al Anser Jr. is not in the championship, championship position at the moment by any means. He's down in seventh place. And don't forget, there is still that protest outstanding from Portland way back in the season. Well, three or four races ago now from Portland, the Penske team is protesting uh, Al Jr.'s uh, disqualification from that race. And that will be heard on the 18th of September, another eight days from now. And what a disappointment it would be if the IndyCar Championship had to wait until that protest is heard. Well, we have uh, 18 laps to go, and let's hope it's decided on the racetrack today. As the cars now form up behind the pace car, we've had very, very few retirements today, very few. Andre Ribeiro, one of uh, only two retirements in this race, so there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of rubber building up on the circuit, a lot of marbles. You've got to keep absolutely on the racing line. And these last 18 or 19 laps are going to be absolutely crucial for uh, not only Gilles de Ferrand, who's looking for his first win of the season, he so nearly had one, uh, but then had an argument uh, coming together with Scott Pruitt and uh, lost that uh, almost certain victory. And uh, Gilles really does deserve a, a win uh, in this, his first year of IndyCar. He's driven beautifully on many occasions. He's had his fair share of mechanical faults. He's had a couple of offs. But uh, nobody at Reynard uh, would be, uh, everybody at Reynard, should I say, everybody at Reynard would be really, really thrilled to see uh, Gilles get uh, a win today. They've already got the Constructors' Championship. Of course, they'd, they'd much prefer if they could see Villeneuve uh, take uh, a proper championship victory this afternoon so they could have the Drivers' Championship and the Constructors' Championships properly sewn up without uh, anything decided in the courtroom, in a, in a protest hearing. That's not the way that, that's uh, not what IndyCar wants, it's not what the fans want. And uh, we shall have to wait another 17 laps here at Laguna Seca in the California sunshine to see exactly what happens. We're riding at the moment with Paul Tracy in the Newman Haslona. He's off to Penske next year. In fact, he starts, it's uh, Michael Andretti. My apologies, Michael Andretti. But uh, Paul Tracy goes to Penske next season. He's going to start testing for them in just a fortnight's time. And another man, of course, who'll be starting a very, very heavy testing program is uh, Jacques Villeneuve, who'll be coming over to Europe and testing for Williams. This is Bobby Rahal's car. A fairly low-key uh, race today for Bobby Rahal, the man who looked as though he was in with a chance at the championship earlier in the year. Uh, not a great day for Bobby Rahal. But uh, very few incidents really, you know, bearing in mind it's the last race of the year and there are a lot of people out there with a lot of things to prove. It's not only uh, 
contract time. It's also time for getting new sponsors and convincing your current sponsors to stay with you. Uh, many people are looking for new teams and teams looking for new drivers. But this man in the yellow, Jim Hall Reynard, who leads the field round, has had a tremendous day at Laguna Seca. And uh, dare we say, no, let's not say it. Uh, Paul Tracy in second, then Gujelman, a great day for Gujelman. And there is Al Junior down in seventh position. And Villeneuve now up to 11th. I say up to 11th because uh, he was in 13th place. He needs to get higher than this to secure the championship. He's got uh, Parker Johnstone in front of him. He should be able to deal with Parker Johnstone, especially now that he has the new front wing on the Reynard, having solved whatever problem that was, whether it was uh, loose carbon fiber or uh, a loose wing end plate, whatever it was, we're not absolutely sure, but there was certainly something wrong with that front wing from very, very early on in the race. Uh, easier to see on TV than uh, on the racetrack, of course. A huge crowd here at uh, Monterey today to watch the uh, race at Laguna Seca. It's a very popular race in the series. They always get a big crowd. It's a great place to watch. There are some fantastic uh, viewing places. And uh, a walk around the circuit is very, very rewarding. You can see cars in all kinds of different corners, uphill and downhill. And uh, a great place to end the season. And there'll be a lot of drivers uh, at uh, Laguna Seca today looking for uh, work next year. We've already seen uh, Ari Leyendijk spectating. And you can be sure there'll be others. We apologise uh, for the loss of picture. It'll be back in just a few seconds. It's, uh, we've had a couple of glitches on the coverage from California this evening. Uh, uh, we're back. Uh, in fact, we were just waiting for the, f just waiting for the field to arrive uh, down here at the hairpin. We thought, thought the picture had frozen there for a moment. But uh, there he is, Gilles de Ferran, the Brazilian. Ex-Formula 3000 driver decided to... Uh, not to uh, tug around at the back of Formula One in a team that uh, he didn't feel was good enough or in uh, any a number of teams he didn't feel were good enough. He decided to go to America, prove his talent there, and uh, he's had some good drives. Whether or not uh, he'll now stay permanently in IndyCar remains to be seen. Christian Fittipaldi, uh, another uh, ex-Formula One man, has had a difficult race today. He's had uh, several unscheduled pit stops, and you can see he's down in 13th position and uh, an even worse day for his uncle Emerson. Unser Jr. now into uh, sixth position and Villeneuve in 11th and that's what uh, we need to watch for the remainder of this race. That's the thing that uh, interests everybody now at the end of the season. Can Villeneuve lift the championship today? Uh, put his Indy car down, get on the plane, come to Europe and start to concentrate on partnering Damon Hill in the Williams Formula One team next season. There's Raul Bozell just ahead of Christian Fittipaldi. A bad day for Raul Bozell today. He's had a, a poor season really, Bozell, after some uh, encouraging showings early in the year. The two Penskis running together. What will Emerson Fittipaldi do next year? There have been rumours about his retirement. The most remarkable racing driver, Emerson. I'm sure everybody would agree with that. Uh, 25 years of uh, success, an extraordinary talent, but uh, not a good year for him in America this year. And remember, Villeneuve got the bad break with the pace car because if DeFerrin had been behind Villeneuve when that yellow came out, he would have made up a whole lap that would have made his job a lot easier again only if Alonso Jr. wins the race will he need all those precious positions. So back to green flag you wrote for a moment there with second place Paul Tracy who sits just behind Jack Villeneuve who is a lap down. The Ferran is able to ease away. Oh, more than ease away. Uh, DeFerrin is in control here, unless he has mechanical failures, he looks as he, ha he has the potential to cover everybody and maybe extend their tremendous record that IndyCar has this year. Well, look at Michael, Michael Andretti alongside of Scott Pruitt. They go through this corner side by side, pushes Pruitt off. That can be a very dangerous corner to run off the right side. Pruitt keeps it under control. They climb the hill. Now will Pruitt be able to challenge? He's got Marco Greco between him now, or just in front of Michael. Greco falls offline. They both come screaming down the hill. Uh, 
And that was a case of who was going to blink. Unfortunately for Scott Pruitt, Michael had that inside line, which is a harder turn to make. But Scott Pruitt rode him all the way, and he was lucky that he didn't get all four wheels off the racetrack. That was a very scary move. And Al Jr. squeaked past Emerson Fittipaldi. So Al Unser Jr., sixth place, still trying to come forward. There comes Sam Pedri. The problem Al Jr. has now is how hard is too hard? You have to make up your own mind inside your helmet. How risky can I begin to make these moves? But quite frankly, with so few laps, only 14 laps left, I think somebody like Alonso Jr. now has to throw caution to the wind and he has to get aggressive and take gambles, because if he doesn't, he's not going to win this. What was that? Another car off on the left side of the race course. Is that Christian? Yes, Christian Fittipaldi. Remember, he moves to Newman Haas next year. Boy, talk about losing track position now. down the hill in fourth place. Michael and Peter Gibbons have been in deep in thought all weekend here trying to work out a compromise handling package for Michael. But you can see Michael's car move around so much and he slides down the inside and Fangio gives him just enough room. Just ahead, the 14 car. Ekblom, interesting story on, on his arriving in A.J. Foyt's car. On his way to be married in Hawaii just happened to be convenient passing through Monterey. Sounds like good credentials to get a drive to me. In a lot fact, of people getting married. Yeah, the season's over. We're going to have Herta get married. Ryan Herta gets married next week. He then has a funny moon in Greece. Then he goes back to Indianapolis to have some of the hardware taken from his leg. And in fact, his team owner, Chip Ganassi, will hear the wedding bells next week. go offline when you follow cars for long periods you get oil smears on your visor then the dust and dirt sticks to it then you take the rip off off and you got a nice clear windscreen again Hunter jr is in sixth place he needs first the focus of the fight now there's a presumption that the ppg cup is moving closer and closer to the pit of jack Villeneuve and will be awarded to him here as the youngest ever champion in the indy cars the focus now will move to the battle at the front of the field. Guzelman is in third place. Paul Tracy is in second. And Jill DeFerrin is 12 laps away from his first IndyCar win. And of course, you are talking irrespective of what happens in the appeal. Even if they got all their points back from Portland, it won't make any difference. Look at the traffic jam here. Yeah, it's much simpler now. Al Hunter needs to win. And Vassar and Rahal, that is a position battle there. Seventh is Rahal. Jimmy Vassar is eighth. So this is a good fight here. There comes little Al down the hill. There's Vassar and Rahal. Johansson is struggling. He's in the mix there. He's a lap down in 14th. Oh, look at Rahal. We saw him wave his fist earlier. He jerks to the inside. Doesn't get by Eglum. Vassar. Vassar continues in pursuit, tries the inside, Gordon's right there as well. Ray Hall all the way though. Oh, look at what Gordon. A Whoa. As Gordon tucks around. Vassar locks up the left front. Vassar trying to get by Ray Hall. Good race here, good battle here for these positions. Points all the way down to 12th. While he's physically present, is not actually into the fight. He's had one very tough day, having to replace a nose after contact. He fell out on the first lap, slid off the course, got back on. He's way, way down in the order. Now there's the sand. You saw Rahal go wide. You saw the sand get swirled in behind the tires of Rahal's car, and Vassar has to run over that. That is one of the difficulties here. In fact, part of those million-dollar-plus 
development that Laguna Seca will go through next year is in fact to put curving, exiting curving on the outside of most of these corners. Bobby Rahal, every race he has finished. He's been in the top 10 except one. He was 13th at Milwaukee. Don't know yet whether he will have a one or a two car team next year. He wants to keep a two car team. They hope to stay together with Raul Bozell, although the partnership of Carl Hogan and Bobby Rahal will be over and done with after in about what? 10 more laps. And some indication that Carl Hogan then joins in some way or another forces with Roger Penske. There's that dust again. You see that gets swirled up by Rejo watch he goes close to the curve again as soon as you get outside that white line that's when you begin to suck the sand onto the racing line Bobby Rejo continues in seventh place 74 laps are complete Al Unser Jr. is sixth needs a win Jill DeFerrin may be scoring his first at this point with only 10 laps remaining in under 10 laps to go here at Laguna Seca, and it looks very much as though Jacques Villeneuve is going to be the IndyCar champion for 1995. Alan Sr. is way down in sixth position, and looking at the race at the moment, there really is, well, no chance really, unless a miracle happens of Al Jr. being first or second in this race. Nine laps to go, and the order is Gilles de Ferran leading in the Reynard Mercedes, from Paul Tracy in the Lola Ford, Maurizio Gugelman in the Reynard Ford, Michael Andretti in the Lola Ford, Scott Pruitt in another Lola Ford, and in sixth position, as we said, Al Unser Jr. in the Penske Mercedes. But a man on the move at the moment is Bobby Rahal. He's in seventh position, and uh, with just uh, under nine laps to go, he's really beginning to move at the moment. He's got a bit stuck behind uh, Stefan Johansson, who's uh, not had a good race today in last year's Penske. But uh, there'll be a lot of excitement uh, in uh, the Jim Hall pit at the moment. This is a very, very tense part of the race in any motor race. There's a lot of rubber on the circuit, a lot of uh, dust and uh, general gunk around off the racing line. And one, one tiny, tiny mistake from uh, Gilles would mean uh, throwing away his first ever IndyCar win. But at the moment, it has to be said, he has not made any mistakes at all. He's driven absolutely beautifully. He has a good lead over Paul Tracy, which uh, will be a great relief to uh, Gilles de Fern because Paul Tracy is, uh, shall we say, well, he's a very aggressive racing driver. So uh, Gilles looking pretty comfortable in the lead at the moment. Unser down in sixth, and it looks as though we'll have Jacques Villeneuve as this year's champion development engine program with Ford this year and you know we just had a lot of problems and you know, as, a, as Ninja took me out at the beginning it cost us a bunch of laps and you know from that point I got together with Andre Ribeiro and uh, you know I never saw him coming and then the steering wheel broke on the car I mean it's just uh, you know just a terrible day for the target scotch cars uh, you know so much promise and yet uh, you know we got nothing to go home with. He starts with a clean slate next weekend you get married. Best wishes for that at least and good luck in 96. Thank you. Wonder if now we've heard two comments that telegraph that maybe they're not going to be a Ford team in the future. I don't know but with the uh, emotion in his voice I would suggest he just grabs Jeanette and go sit on the beach in Greece and enjoy yourself and just look forward to a much more productive next year because Brian Herta has all the speed and the technical ability that he needs to be a winner. He's already been on the pole, but he hasn't quite won yet. Physically on the racetrack, just behind Jimmy Vassar is Robbie Gordon. As we watch Al Unser Jr. move on, Scott Pruitt tries to get him, can't get it done. Pruitt comes across. It's not over yet. Maintains the line, but look at him coming off the corner. Oh, there's one of the moves we talked about earlier. How brave can you be down the inside? Road Pruitt all the way, and of course Pruitt then locked up the brakes and kept the position. This is a day that these two are going to talk about later. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, just to follow up on your comment about 96 and what would be the power plant of choice for Chip Ganassi, I just put the question to him a moment ago. He said, well, I have no comment. <laughs> Still in front a little Al. There's one of the changes we 
thought might be made was that the Newman Haas team would go with Honda power plants, but in fact, along with Christian Fittipaldi's announcement this weekend, they also announced, in fact, they will have Ford power next season for Michael and Christian. Scott Pruitt heading for turn 10. Again, over a million dollars in improvements coming to just this section of the race course next year. Lengthen out the pitch, change the position of turn 11. I'll tell you what, folks up here, you know, and much of what happens at this race all goes to charity. It's such a great event and a good way to end the season. I just heard something misfire. I don't know what it was. I don't know whether it was Scott Pruitt. It was, it was as, as Scott Pruitt went by one of our camera positions. It doesn't look as if he's any trouble here, but this team led by Jim McGee, I think Paul has heard to say, has more fun than anybody else. They have such a relaxed style and outlook about this team. They believe so much in Scott Pruitt, particularly as a test driver. And he's so good in racing situations. It's great to see that he did get his first win. And their test program starts immediately after this race finishes. I'll tell you something else. Scott, like so many others here, it's a big family deal for him. His family is always at all the racetracks. You see his mom all the time. But that's true of everybody. Allenser Jr. actually camps at most of the racetracks. laps to go in the season. By the way, congratulations to the Daly family. Beth Daly, going to be the Rookie of the Year in, in uh, the Pro Women's Division of the IJSBA Pro National Jet Ski Tour. Glad you remember. You prompted me to say it. I had to go through it. <laughs> congratulations. You hear that misfire again? Yeah. There's something misfiring as Scott Pruitt goes under our camera position. He cracks the throttle just over the top of the hill. We are talking about Robbie Gordon. I just want to wrap that up. Robbie Gordon, when he finishes here today, there's a helicopter racing. And he's waiting because he's going off-road racing. Yet today, Jill DeFerrin climbs the hill, the leader of the race. They That's deserve it. a win. Absolutely, they do. That team has done a good job. They have shown so much speed. Jill DeFerrin almost won the European 3000 Championship last year. Has already had a test in a Formula One car with Frank Williams. Unfortunately, David Coulthard tested the following week, and he got the drive. But Jill DeFerrin has shown such a turn of speed, and they will move to the Honda engine power plant for next season. And there's second place, Paul Tracy, eight seconds back from DeFerrin. Just ahead of him is Vildo on his way to a championship. Guzelman and Andretti. This could develop into a battle for third pretty quickly. Four laps to go in the PPG IndyCar World Series for 1995. Season fires up again with the first race at Miami next year. New track. And in fact, from what we've seen of that track that Ralph Sanchez is putting together, it's going to be spectacular. Multi-purpose facility out at Homestead. Winter test program down there for five days in January. It will be spectacular. Tracy, that has been the rule of thumb here. When cars begin to get away from you, you know the tires are going off. Michael in chase. Oh, they all get in. We're going to hear, I'm sure. Boy, that's the slickest I've ever run on. And right now, unless there's an awful big crash or an awful lot of very fast racing cars dropping out with mechanical failure, Barry Green can begin to lick his lips and taste that champagne because he is so close now to taking that championship home. Yeah, but I'm willing to bet that he's not doing it yet. I mean, he's so well, careful. He wants to see the flag. He wants to know it's over. There's the Farron. As he comes off of the second turn, goes into three. That's what eight seconds of a lead looks like at Laguna Seca. Remember, though, he is in such control here, he doesn't need to go over the limit. Just nice and consistent. He lost his first race win with precious laps to go at Cleveland when he tripped over a back marker. His car owner, Jim Hall, they move over to Honda next year. I asked Jim, does he still get the same kick 
out of racing now when he can't be quite as inventive as he was in years past. Remember the Chaparral, the high wing, the sucker vacuum car, sports car, yeah. the Jackie Stewart drove, never won a race, but it was spectacular. He said he still gets a kick from racing and winning at the front, even though IndyCar racing is controlled and regulated so much more than racing in the past was, and not allowing people like Jim Hall to be as inventive as he likes to be. Well, even with, even with that car, the, the one, the soccer car, Jackie Stewart, he outlawed it so quick that he... Uh, that gives you an idea how the potential of that, that that car has. Here comes Michael now closing down on Guzelman as this battle heats up. Battle for third. Let's listen to Michael play with the throttle. will take the championship, Gary. I'll tell you what, I don't know how you ever, ever get used to this feeling that Jim Hall has right now. First time since the spring of 91. What a way to count the season. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty exciting. We've been working hard to do it, and we got a good team together, and they finally put it together. We knew we could do it this year, but it took, took, a, took a long time, and uh, we're pleased. It's a great way to finish the season. Spectacular as they got second last week. They win it here. Let's go to Jan. Well, with even greater emotions, I'm sure, is Barry Green. How are your nerves here? Congratulations on the championship. Thanks, John. What a great day. I mean, you know, I've been worried there for a while. It wasn't a normal day at the office for us. Junior was, Junior was bounding his, uh, his attack through the field, and, uh, you know, we were going backwards there for a while, but uh, we had two punctures and knocked the front wing off and hit some debris on the racetrack. But, I mean, just we soldiered on. The guys did a great job. Still finished 11th, and... Uh, got the championship just feels fantastic got to thank all my sponsors players and Klein tools and Ray best it's just all for all their support and great team effort on team green's part i mean i just love them all well judging by your hat you guys had a lot of confidence coming in already there 1995 indycar champion congratulations thanks a lot john it feels damn good i tell you thank you i want one of those team green the 1995 indycar champion caps they've held them on now for three races and finally the dream comes true. 
a Canadian, the youngest ever to win an IndyCar championship. Jacques Villeneuve has taken the win in the IndyCar series. We'll be back to talk with him. Well, that is a very, very good result on two counts. Gilles de Ferran wins the race, his first ever IndyCar win and Rookie of the Year. And Jacques Villeneuve is the 1995 IndyCar champion. A great day in California. And to round up uh, the top six again for you was uh, this man here, Gilles de Ferran from Paul Tracy, Maurizio Gugelman, Michael Andretti, Scott Perret and Alancer in sixth position. Jacques Villeneuve finished 11th, but that really, really doesn't matter. He is the IndyCar champion. A great IndyCar season. It's been absolutely thrilling. Every race exciting. Uh, not a dull moment this year. And uh, ever since we began in March, there has been uh, interest, intrigue, drama, and excitement both on and off the racetrack. And that's exactly what motor racing is all about. It's been a good year for Honda, they've got their engine program together and uh, they will probably be even stronger next year. Firestone tyres are beginning to come good. Gilles de Ferran, the Rookie of the Year, has uh, not surprised many people. I think everybody thought he was going to be quick and boy he has been. And a well-deserved win for the Brazilian. Not a good year for Penske, well not by their standards anyway. A great year for Reynard, champion constructors, and there is the man, the man of the moment, the young 24-year-old French-Canadian Jacques Villeneuve, and we'll be seeing a lot of him in Europe next season, and maybe we'll get a few, a few words now with a very, very happy Gilles de Ferran. No, we don't, uh, but I'm sure we will in just... Uh, a few moments, be talking to Gilles, he looks absolutely cool, calm and collected, as uh, he almost always does, and uh, I know, I'm sure his friend David Coulter will be very pleased to see uh, this fellow, and there is uh, De Ferran Jr., and uh, that is a very, very nice picture, that is a great picture, what a wonderful way to end the season. <laughs> I'm not going to get much chance of peace and quiet, Gilles, I don't think. Emotion, you know. But the crew did such a fantastic job, we came very close over here, and this is just great. <laughs> I mean, I can't express myself better. She's fascinated by this microphone. Last week, you had to come through adversity with a backup car at the last minute to finish second. Now you get the win. Did you ever think that you could cap off a rookie season as you have done in an eight-day span? Well, I don't know. I just tried my best, and the team did such a great job. I mean, this weekend, we had everybody covered. It was, it was really good. I mean, it was a reward for the whole season's work. I'm just very pleased. The Pennzoil team is just the best, and I'll be here next year. You are now the Rookie of the Year in this most competitive series. What do you think that'll mean to your countrymen in Brazil? Uh, that means a lot to me, for sure. And I think it will mean a lot to all the fans, both here and, and back in Brazil. This is a great feeling. I, don't, I can't express it. I've never felt that good. Does it make up for the disappointment of Cleveland when you were that close to getting the first win? And more. <laughs> it makes up and it's better again. We let him savor the moment with his lovely daughter, his wife, the crew the family and of course the Brazilian Gilles announcers Ferran. they want to send the word a to their homeland cool what a magnificent moment a good as we congratulate and a great Gilles 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 what a way to end the well, season Gary, with all the family the there the race, and the here's the champion Jacques Villeneuve looking uh, pretty relieved to finish it here and not have to wait till September oh yeah it's great to, to know what the championship is right now uh, whatever happened with uh, the appeal and we've won it and then you know that's great for for all team green they've done a great job all season uh, now the championship it shows the the chemistry the work of a whole season and and they sure proved they were the best now share your emotions we know you're leaving next year is this a bittersweet moment for you i mean you've won the championship but this is your last indycar race for a while yeah it's, it was the last race uh, with all the guys there and uh, it's gonna be tough and it would have been great if we could have finished on the podium but you know uh, we did a lot of pit stops today, so we worked well together. <laughs> I know, Jack, you've got a lot of celebrating to do. Again, congratulations. Thank you. Let's go back to Gary Gerald. And Paul Tracy. Well, as Jack rightly says, it is going to be tough. Today, Formula One is tough, whoever you are and uh, wherever you are. But uh, that is a tremendous uh, uh, victory for uh, Jacques Villeneuve. Paul Tracy, second today, uh, Tracy, and off to Penske next season. Well, I thought uh, before we got that yellow one, we were holding station with him that if we got a yellow, we were going to get a chance. and. Uh, 
but he was just too strong strong for us. He drove a fantastic race for, for Jim Hall, and I'm really proud of him. He did a good job. Uh, we, you know, we struggled the last 15 laps with tires. I, I ran out of rear tires and was, was hanging on the last bit, and uh, Guzman was able to catch up. But, we, you know, we brought it home for the Kmart Budweiser car in second. It's a fantastic end of the year. Any emotions now that might be a little bit strange as you go back toward Team Penske, uh, cutting now this association after one year with Newman Haas? Well, it's been a great association. I think uh, we haven't lived up to what our promise was, but uh, you know, all the crew guys did a great job this year. They really put their heart into it, and uh, great pit stops so was able to get me by people all year long, and I got to really thank them. And you know, it's uh, moving on, I guess, back home, back to Penske where I started. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. We're going to have a full test program over the winter, so I'm, I'm really jazzed about that. With 10 different winners this year, I think the message is clearly written. It's tough to become a champion. You've got a big challenge next year. That's for sure. It's definitely tough to win, and you know, just to get a win is tough with so many guys are running so strong, and it's a, you know, this is the best championship in the world, I think. Okay, claim that spot on the podium. Congratulations. Thanks, Gary. And Paul? Paul Tracy, one of the people, along with Michael Andretti, who will be very interested to see how Villeneuve goes in uh, Formula One next season. And he seems to be having a not shaving competition with Johnny Herbert at the moment. Paul Tracy uh, seems to be sporting that stubble every time we see him these days. And looking at Johnny today on the grid at Monza, he obviously uh, is enjoying uh, having a bit of stubble. Anyway, uh, apart from all that, the end of uh, a tremendous IndyCar season and uh, a great place to end the season in the sunshine of California at uh, Laguna Seca near the uh, city of Monterey on the uh, west coast of the United States. Great atmosphere at this meeting and uh, I think uh, everybody apart uh, of course from the opposition <laughs> will be very happy to see uh, young Villeneuve be the IndyCar champion and uh, certainly Gilles de Ferran has a lot of fans in America as well as all those legions of fans uh, over here in Europe and uh, everybody at Reynard will be over the moon I think is the cliche <laughs> they'll be uh, totally uh, delighted to see Gilles win that race today at uh, Laguna and uh, what a year for Reynard too, champion constructors and uh, there'll be a lot of uh, uh, people wanting to order a Reynard I'm sure for 1996 whether they want to have a Mercedes uh, power plant or a Honda or a Ford remains to be seen uh, the Ford engine's given a few problems to uh, Newman Haas and Ganassi this season but uh, Ford is a big, big, strong company, and they'll be uh, right back on top. But what about Toyota? Next season, of course, uh, Dan Gurney's coming in with uh, the Eagle team and a Toyota engine. And it'll be interesting to see how they go. There's Maurizio Guzelman. And we're not going to hear from Maurizio, unfortunately, but uh, a good drive from him today. Third position for Maurizio and uh, he's, having a, he's had a good year in IndyCar, an up and down year, but a good year generally. He's uh, had some very impressive drives. And uh, look at that, two Brazilians in the uh, top three. And then uh, Americans, fourth, fifth and sixth, and a, ca and a Canadian in second position. That man in 13th place, Juan Fangio, he'll be driving for Dan Gurney's Toyota Eagle team next season. It's unlikely that uh, they'll start winning straight away next season. There'll be a lot of uh, development still to be done on both uh, that uh, Toyota engine and the car. They haven't done a tremendous amount of testing yet. And uh, the two retirements, Brian Herter and Andre Ribeiro. Brian Herter and Andre Ribeiro having a, a collision, a spectacular collision for Ribeiro, which put him out of the race, and eventually Brian Herter retired as well. Herter, the teammate to Jimmy Vassar, who I think has been... Uh, one of the uh, most interesting uh, points of the season, really. Jimmy Vassar, very, very quick in Formula Atlantic, come into IndyCar. This is his second season of it. And uh, some very impressive performances from Jimmy Vassar. He'll definitely be, into, be a man to watch next year. And uh, we go back now to watch some of the highlights of this race. This, uh, quite obviously, is the start, with Villeneuve taking the lead and Robbie Gordon losing it already. Not a good day for uh, Robbie Gordon. That's Adrian Fernandez. Uh, Coming into the corkscrew, getting it very, very wrong indeed. Alessandro Zampedri is stranded on the circuit. This is our first pit stop for Gilles de Ferran. And uh, went extremely smoothly, as did all uh, de Ferran's pit stops today. And uh, Villeneuve comes round uh, just in time to slot into second position behind de Ferran. Things didn't look too bad for Villeneuve at this stage, but now they did. 
a lot of trouble with the left front tyre today, Jacques Villeneuve, and that turned out to be uh, caused by something working loose underneath the left part of the front wing. More trouble from Robbie Gordon, this time running into Guerrero, and uh, this is Ribeiro and Brian Herter. Whoops, that could have been a lot. Uh, could have been a lot worse for Andre Ribeiro. Luckily, though, he got away with it, but uh, no chance of continuing. It then got very traffic -y out there, Michael Andretti being extremely aggressive on Scott Pruitt, as we've come to expect from Michael Andretti. But here is the man of the day, Gilles de Ferrer, in the Mercedes-powered Reynard, and uh, the Jim Hall crew absolutely thrilled with that, and so they should be. Jim Hall's seen just about everything there is to see in motor racing. The man who invented wings, maybe, we could uh, call Jim Hall. Remember the Chaparral? Wow, that was... Uh, an absolutely fascinating car. I'd love to see the Chaparral come over and do a few laps in England sometime. Maybe the Goodwood Festival Speed will uh, succeed in getting the Chaparral at some point. That would be fantastic. So, the end of another IndyCar season. Rob Widow's uh, rounding up uh, the series for you tonight. Hope to be with you next season. Contract time for commentators as well, of course, not just for racing drivers. But uh, thanks to everybody here at Eurosport. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, live coverage of every single race in the uh, IndyCar series. And it'll be back live again uh, on Eurosport, of course. The series are a bit split next year with the new IRL. But uh, whatever, there'll be uh, plenty of terrific action to watch, as usual, in this uh, American series. And uh, we will definitely uh, be most interested in uh, Paul Tracy's return to Penske. That will certainly be uh, something to watch. And he will be uh, with Al Anser Jr., of course, and uh, possibly with Emerson Fittipaldi, although Emerson Fittipaldi's had a very, very, very poor year by his standards this year. Penske have not really been uh, on top of the program this year. They've made uh, tremendous improvements over the last few races, but it was a very, very disappointing start to the year for Penske. And there, as we heard Paul Tracy saying earlier on, they're going to be starting uh, a very intensive and very serious test program in just uh, a week's time from now. The season, by the way, gets underway in Miami.